Last week I told you about the garden spot that we've attempted to cultivate over at the Parsons property for really about the past 20 years. I've got a picture of it up here on the screen for you to see. That garden spot has taught me a lot. It's taught me a lot about the difficulties of breaking new ground and uh, the battles that you have to fight every single year just to get a crop to produce. The first battle you have to fight is against the climate. Every single year the climate presents different challenges. Sometimes there's a late frost and sometimes there's storms and wind and sometimes there's a drought where there's not nearly enough rain and these are things over which you just don't have any control. But there are some things that you have to fight against like blight and pests and weeds. These are battles which at least you have some hope of getting the upper hand. The fiercest of all of these battles for us on our garden spot is the fight against weeds. Josh will put up a picture right now, uh, and both he and I know exactly what that is. That is a picture of a cockle bird. There are literally thousands of those probably lying on the ground over there in our garden spot right now. And even though it looks large in this picture, it's really quite small. If you've ever had any experience with cockle birds, you realize that the fact that they're small uh, is deceptive because that is a wicked little seed right there. The presence of that little seed in the garden marks the beginning of a wicked scourge. If you leave that unchecked for very long, really just for one growing season, that little seed can unleash a firestorm on your plot of land. One or two little seeds turns into thousands and thousands in just a matter of months. And once cobblers get started, they're almost impossible to get rid of. We've struggled with these weeds for, for years in our garden spot. And I can say without reservation that, that the battle against weeds probably drives more people to stop gardening than anything else. I've heard people say, just watch for that Johnson grass or, or the pig weed or whatever the weed might be. It's what makes me vow every single year that I'm going to just forget about gardening and go to the farmer's market and let somebody else do it and maybe start back when I've got more time to fight that battle more effectively. But every single year, when January or February rolls around, I begin to change my mind. And I'll have to admit even if it is with reluctance, struggling with weeds has taught me a thing or two about life. More importantly, it's taught me a few, a few things about faith. Some valuable lessons about my life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. It turns out that Jesus was no stranger to the endless battle that farmers have always fought with weeds. I don't know if they had cockleburs in his part of the world or not. But as much as he talks about agriculture in the Gospels, it makes me wonder if Jesus didn't raise a garden or at least help his mother and his father in the family garden because he uses agricultural images all through his teaching. He uses this age-old struggle between farmers and weeds to point to a much larger, much more consequential battle a battle that takes place not in the physical, earthly realm, but in the spiritual realm. I want to let Jesus speak for himself as we read from Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. This is the parable of the weeds. Jesus says to his disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a, fa a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night, as the workers slept, the farmer's enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat. And then he slipped away in the darkness. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. And the farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field you planted is, is full of weeds. Where did all those weeds come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer explained. 
Should we pull out all the weeds, they asked. No, the farmer replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do that. Let both grow together until the harvest comes. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, to tie them into bundles, and to burn them, and to put the gathered wheat into the barn. Guys, it is obvious that Jesus has a lot more in mind here than just writing Farmer's Almanac article. He's talking about the coming of the kingdom of God on earth. Many of his parables start out like the kingdom of heaven is like this. And so he's describing what the kingdom of God looks like on earth, about the process by which God will slowly but surely take back this world that he has created from the possession and the power of evil. He's talking about how God intends to make things right through the coming of his son Jesus into the world. How God intends to set creation free from its bondage to sin, which it suffered under for so many, many years. If you really want to understand what Jesus is talking about, in the parable of the weeds, you got to go back to the Sermon on the Mount. That's located earlier in the Gospel of Matthew in verses in chapters 5 and 6 and 7 uh, in his Gospel because it's here in this Sermon on the Mount that Jesus spells out why he came. He spells out the radical difference between what the kingdom of God looks like and what the kingdom of the world looks like. He says things like, blessed are the poor, and the persecuted. Blessed are those who are humble and meek and those whose hearts hunger after righteousness. You see, Jesus wants everybody who hears to hear to know that ever since his arrival on earth, a battle has been going on. A battle between the values of heaven and the values of the world. And even though he spells that battle out and puts it in front of everybody in the Sermon on the Mount, that battle actually began in Bethlehem. It began when Jesus was born, in the manner in which he was born. You see, Jesus coming to Bethlehem and being born in a stable is not just a peaceful little story meant to entertain our children at Christmas and give them something to, to reenact on the stage of here. In reality, Bethlehem is a battle cry. It is an outcry against all the things that the world values, things like status and money and political power and pomp and fame and worldly recognition. Even the place that Jesus chooses to be born here it's, it's about it's a battle of the values that Jesus came to wage against the powers of evil in the world. You see, Jesus was not born in a palace. He didn't have a host of servants or a royal court to welcome him when he came into the world. His earthly welcoming committee consisted of lowly shepherds and, and farm animals. His bed was a manger filled with straw. Guys, what I want you to see on this Sunday of Epiphany is that every story Jesus tells, every truth that he taught points to this battle that he came into the world to win. It points to the light that Jesus shines into the middle of the darkness. It points to this battle between what is good and right and just and that which is evil and erroneous and false. And here in Matthew 13, Jesus wants his disciples to know that this battle will not be easy for them to fight. It's just like the farmers in this battle with the weeds. It's going to take time, Jesus says. It's going to take sacrifice that you can't make in and of your own strength. You have to rely on my strength. It's going to take hard work and it's going to take patience and endurance on the part of all of his followers. But he says, for those who endure, for those who fight the good fight for what is right and what is good, the grip of evil will be broken. The values of God's kingdom will
will prevail. Today I want to tell you two really important truths about Jesus' parable of the weeds here. What he wants to, to teach us here. It's two truths that his disciples cannot afford to forget. Uh, let's look at the first truth now about how the enemy is going to attack. The enemy will always attack, he says, in, in times and in ways that we do not expect. If you go back and you read the story again, the enemy of the farmer, he doesn't knock on the farmer's door in the middle of the night and say, excuse the intrusion, sir, but I just wanted to give you a heads up that I'm getting ready to plant a bunch of weeds in your wheat patch. No, the enemy comes under cover of darkness when the farmer and his workers are asleep when they least expect an attack. That's how the evil one works to draw us away from our purpose and from our salvation that God has bought for us in Jesus Christ. Several years ago, a good friend of mine and I were traveling up to Lake Unalaska. We were going to annual conference. And as we were traveling down I 85, going right down through Charlotte, we were passing some of those downtown exits, and, and my friend told me that he really didn't like traveling through that part of town by himself. Now, he was a grown man, and I wondered to myself, what's so bad about this section of I-85? Well, he went on to explain that years earlier, a particular exit that he had just passed was the one that he used to go and buy his drugs on the street in downtown Charlotte, the drugs which had fed his addiction for years and years. And even though he had been sober for over 10 years, he still had feelings of dread and fear. And temptation would come over him when he would pass by that exit. Now guys, I don't profess to understand how my friend felt because I've never struggled with that kind of addiction. But his transparency that day helped me to realize something which Jesus teaches over and over again in the gospel. Jesus is telling us here that the enemy is always waiting for his chance to attack you. He's waiting to sow a bunch of weeds in your wheat field. He's always looking for an opportunity to disrupt your growth in grace. To destroy your effectiveness as a witness to his transforming power over human life. And so when we say yes to Jesus, what you need to understand is that that's not the end of the battle. That's the beginning of the battle. You need to keep that in mind the next time when you're struggling with a problem in life or struggling with temptation or whatever that struggle might be. Jesus will not desert you in the battle. That leads us to the second truth that this parable teaches us today. Our response to the enemy's attacks, they can't be reactive or impulsive. Instead, that response has to be patient. It has to be long-suffering. It has to be willing to wait on God's timing. I want you to look again at the farmer's response when the workers come to ask him if he should pull up the weeds that are among the wheat in the field. He says in verse 29, no, you'll uproot the wheat if you go out and pull up the weeds. So let both of them grow together until the harvest. And then I will tell the workers to sort out the weeds, to tie the weeds up in bundles, and then we will burn them and destroy them. Guys, Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to desert you. But you have to wait on my timing. Sometimes when we're in the middle of a bad situation, when we're suffering under the consequences of our own sin or somebody else's sin, our first impulse is to do whatever it takes to solve the problem. Boom. Quickly. Get it over and done with. To extricate ourselves from a bad situation as quickly as we can. But guys, more often than not, what happens? If you follow your first impulse on how to get over a problem, your efforts will make the situation worse instead of better. What Jesus wants you to see here is that sometimes he calls us to wait. Sometimes he calls us to endure, to trust that there will indeed come a day when God and heaven's armies will bundle up all the weeds and 
burned down when we will be set free from our bondage. What Jesus is calling us to see here is that freedom and deliverance always, always have to come by his time and by his means and not our own. So this is a word of caution to us. Don't pull up the crop trying to rid yourself of the weeds. Trust God to bring in the harvest and to burn the weeds and to set you free from whatever it is that binds you in His time. I want to look at our garden spot one more time before we end. I, I truly, truly hope that when I get to heaven, there's a little plot of land up there somewhere that won't have any weeds. Or at least if it does have weeds, I can plow it one time and then it'll look like this where there are no weeds and they won't come back anymore. But until that day comes, I'm going to trust God to give me the grace I need to endure and learn and progress and grow in my reliance upon Him with each passing day. There's something printed on the front of every single bulletin that ever goes out from this church that I hope you've noticed. Right under it where it says Lost Grove United Methodist Church, it says a place to grow in grace. And that phrase is not there just to fill up space or to be a creative play on words. No, that phrase is there for a reason. Every single one of us struggles with something. We all have weeds growing in the middle of our garden. And the only way that we're ever going to pull those weeds up for good, to plow them under so that they won't come back, is by depending on grace. Grace that God freely gives. So whatever your weed patch is, whatever your struggle is, Jesus wants you to know there is coming a day when those battles will be no more. When God's power will prevail over your struggle. And I pray right now that you will allow God to give you that assurance as we bow before Him in prayer. Father, I thank you for this place to grow in grace. Thank you that over and over again you promised us in your word that, that you will never leave us or forsake us. Even when the battle seemed the fiercest, O oh Lord, even when the weeds seem like they're totally out of control, remind us that the master gardener, he still has a plan. A plan to deliver us from the, the attack of the enemy. A plan to bring the harvest home and to, to deliver it, O oh Lord, safely into the barn. So until that day comes, until our freedom comes, O oh Lord, teach us to rely fully on your grace, to use the means of grace that you give us, O oh Lord, that lead us out of our bondage and into your freedom. It's in the hope of that freedom that we pray this day. And that hope's name is Jesus. Father, I thank you that he is with us in all things.